live on Facebook. Lovely to see you all again. I'm Dr. Meg Arrell. Um, I'm a chartered health psychologist and I'm here with Rob Hobson, who is a registered nutritionist um, on behalf of HealthSpan. And today we are talking about anxiety and sleep. Yeah, um, apologies for these technical glitches. Um, so we are back. Um, so Meg, for anybody that missed that first question in our last attempt, um, should we just start again? So the impact of, of lockdown, um, emotionally, physically, how is this, how is this affecting us in your eyes? So absolutely, there are a myriad of effects, both physically and mentally, and the two are really closely intertwined. So um, what's important, I think, that we discuss is the stress response, because people are feeling really quite stressed and anxious. And the stress response, it isn't necessarily bad. It can feel bad because um, it can give us heart palpitations. It can make us feel nauseous, can make us feel sweaty and just generally quite unwell. But actually, the stress response is adaptive. We have developed it, uh, developed it in our evolutionary um, journey to really survive very immediate threats so if we think of our ancestors on on the plane see this was us we used to have to fight off lions and tigers and bears and like really very very dangerous things Rawr. now if you think about it this is much more dangerous than than we were we developed tools but we also developed a stress response to be able to fight or to run away to flight so the fight or flight response, which most of us have heard of, it's incredibly useful then, and it is still useful now. So if we say are in some really difficult traffic and somebody swerves in front of us, that stress response allows us to, to break, to stop or to veer so that we can survive. And it does this via a complex cascade of neurochemicals and hormones. The two most important ones are cortisol and adrenaline. And these hormones, they give us specific, basically like superpowers. So they strengthen our muscles with uh, supercharges some glucose. They make our pupils dilate so that we can take in the information around us. They do all these things that allow us to survive. But actually most days, we're not gonna have the car swerve in front of us. And if we do, it's only for a few seconds, but there are lots of perceived threats, okay, in the environment. Some of these can be ruminative worries and thoughts, but at the moment, the perceived threat is also a real threat. So it's quite complex. So COVID-19 is a real threat. And we are being told about it 24 seven through the news media, which is really important. We need to know what's going on, but it can make it feel very, very immediate. And this can heighten the stress response. And what happens in this acute response, if it's not allowed to go down back to equilibrium, uh, equilibrium back to homeostasis, what happens is our cortisol level cannot go back to where it needs to go. And so we have a heightened stress response that then over time can cause some health issues like insomnia. Okay, and I, that's interesting because I know that when I talked about sleep, you know, stress and anxiety are a leading cause of poor sleep. And that's also because, you know, your body actually is, is full of cortisol when it's stressed. You're going to sleep, it's waking you up, you're waking up and the body's producing more cortisol to get you out of bed, which is what mm -hmm. you said, you know, to, to get you up and that's, that's adding to the stress. So... Um, and also stress can affect immunity, right? So if we're getting more stress, you just said there about how stress can affect long-term health, which I think is to do with sort of that low-grade inflammation that can occur. Um, but our immune systems can take a hit, can't they? So it, it's, it's quite difficult to stay well when you're, when you're stressed. It doesn't help, does it? it? It doesn't help, but what I want people to know is that in the short term, it isn't damaging yeah okay so i don't want um viewers to come away and feel like because they've been stressed for these past few weeks that they were going to develop more health problems yeah. um generally uh we can cope with even some chronic stress but definitely over the long term so there is some amazing research in the field of psychoneuroimmunology and i'm so glad i said that in one go <laughs> I'm I'm P and I. let's stick with p and i so p and i research <laughs> there is a huge body of research and it's one of my favorite areas because what it shows in some really clear experimental studies is that long-term stress does have an impact on immune function and healing 
So I'll give you one example. Um, these studies were carried out with uh, caregivers, so people that are caring for um, family members who had uh, serious and chronic health conditions. So they had stress every single day. Um, and one study took uh, a little gum biopsy um, in their mouth yeah. and it was measured, the healing time was measured between people who had to care for loved ones and people who did not. And those who had to care for loved ones, they had a significantly, significantly longer healing time. So it took them three to four days longer for this tiny little wound to heal because they were under so much stress. Mm -hmm. Now, there are also studies that look at um, immune function with regard to, to viruses, so uh, to a common cold. And it did take people who were under chronic stress longer to recover from a virus as well. So it is important, but yeah. I do want people to understand that um, most likely their immune system, if they're doing other things to support it, they will be okay. Okay, yeah, it, uh, definitely worth pointing out. So another topic, um, I think that's been coming up is how to deal with your family and your partner. <laughs> and else in your home that you're kind, they're kind of getting on your nerves now. So thinking about, and, and this can impact on sleep. I know I've yeah. talked quite a bit about snoring and those kind of issues as well. I think first of all, how do we find a little space at yeah. home for ourselves? And secondly, how do we approach those topics with people in a sensitive way? Those things that are really getting on our nerves or maybe like I said, preventing us from sleeping well. Okay, okay, so let's let's take the first part of your question first. Would, would you mind doing a little exercise with me, Rob? Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> okay, great, okay, so you are sitting down. Are your feet flat on the floor? They are now. Okay, great. So what I would like you to do is to take a deep breath through your belly, through your diaphragm, on the count of one, two, three, and then breathe out on the count of one, two, three, four. Okay, now if you're comfortable, please close your eyes, but you don't have to. Yeah. Okay, so think of a place that you feel the most relaxed. Now this can be a real place or this can be somewhere from your imagination. Just take a moment and think of that place where you were as chilled as you could possibly be and let us know. Do you have a place of mind? I do. Where is it? It's on the beach. Great, okay. So bring this to your mind in as much detail as you can and start by telling me five things you can see. What can you see? Obviously the sea. Mm -hmm. uh, boats. Um, I can see oh. other people on the beach enjoying mm -hmm. themselves. Um, rocks and I guess people in the sea swimming around. Okay, okay. Now think about four sounds. What are four things that you can hear? Uh, crashing of the waves. I guess I can hear um, animals. Um, I can hear other people laughing. And I guess I can sort of hear the noise of walking across the sand. Great, great. Now, smells. Tell me three things you can smell. So the sea, mm -hmm. um, I can smell nice food, <laughs> mm -hmm. and sun cream. That's what I smell. And then sensations. What are two things? Tell me two things you can feel. It would be the sun on my skin, the heat, and I guess the feel of the sand. And then finally, one, tell me your overarching feeling. How do you feel right now? Uh, there'll be a sense of well-being, that, that kind of sense of satisfaction, contentment, I think is the word I'm looking for. That is great. Thank you, Rob. Now take another deep breath on the count of one, two, three, in, and a breath out on one, two, three, four. Open your eyes. Feeling very chilled. <laughs> Brilliant. So that is a really simple five, four, three, two, one. 
That's really um, nice. Anybody could try that at home, couldn't they? If they, if, if they go back to this um, this Facebook Live and they might want to try that themselves and think about their space and mm-hmm. work through what you've said and, and find their own their own space. And the thing is, conversation. you don't have to be in a quiet space. I know so many people who have uh, kids at home in particular or, or, or just other people in the house. It can be really hard to physically find that space. Yeah. With practice, you can just do this in your head. And yep. it's so powerful. Um, it's so simple. It's one of the most powerful tools that I used. And the breathing is very important. So yeah. that deep diaphragmatic breathing, it's when your belly rises, <coughs> excuse me, on the inhale and dips back down on the exhale. It actually breaks that stress response and it triggers the parasympathetic nervous yep. system, which brings down that stress response. Okay. So it is incredibly important. It's something we can do and it gets easier with practice. So if you like anything, it's a skill. And yep. the more you practice it, the more you can go to that place. So let's say you're happy place um, very quickly, even if there is a bit of chaos around you. Okay. All right. So I guess um, the other thing is thinking about um, anxiety as well. Are there any other sort of techniques? I know you've mentioned this stop um, Mm -hmm. technique when I've spoken to you. Is that something people can use as well to help deal with anxiety? Absolutely. So this is great for recurring intrusive thoughts, but it's also good for some of the behaviours that we may be um, engaging in that perhaps we don't want to like pop, you know, go into the fridge constantly, yeah. a bit of uh, overeating, comfort eating. So I work a lot in emotional eating and, and it is a problem. And what it's about, it's about taking back control and being in control of our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviors. Okay. So stop. What does it stand for? So S stands for actually stop, stop what you're doing. So if you're walking towards the fridge, stop. Or if you're having those recurring uh, thoughts, say stop in your head and just halt that moment in time. Okay. Next, T is for take a breath. And we've talked about the breathing and how important it is. So breathe in deeply through your belly and then out again. Now this grounds you and anchors you in the moment um, and allow you to um, practice this technique in a more profound way. Okay. Okay. So the O is for observe and this is about raising your conscious awareness to take control over your thoughts your feelings and your actions so what what exactly are you doing now we can sort of be on autopilot so much especially when we're experiencing anxiety because so much of our sort of cognitive capacity is taken up with those thoughts and and that feeling of just not you know wanting to be somewhere else like out of our own heads because it's very uncomfortable observe what are the exact thoughts you are having how do you feel check in with yourself basically the o is for observe okay that's really interesting yeah and then the p is for proceed so this isn't about um not ever going to the fridge and having a snack and it's not about you know pushing away those thoughts but it's about having the choice being in control if you still want that snack, have it, but have it mindfully. Know that you've taken that choice. If that thought is something that you want to carry on and continue and see through, do it mindfully. But perhaps if it is a very anxious or worrying thought, challenge that thought with logic and with evidence. So we yeah. do that quite a lot in psychology. So if you're starting to catastrophize about COVID-19, remind yourself that yes, you know, this situation is, is certainly been very difficult for many people, but most people do recover and we are sort of, you know, working through it as a community. So STOP will allow you to grab back that control and you are the person in the driving seat. Okay, brilliant. And um, we've had a question through from um, one of our, our guests, um, which is about at night, the anxiety you get at night. So can they use this technique if maybe they're lying in bed and they're feeling really stressed out and they can feel that anxiety bubbling over? Is this, mm-hmm. is this a technique they can use then? Absolutely. And I would say specifically to use it with the deep diaphragmatic breathing as well. The thing about anxiety and sleeping problems and insomnia, what can often happen is we can have an acute and and Rob, you'll know so much about this, an acute sort of phase of sleeplessness. Um, And it is our cognitive thought process that then turns this acute phase into a chronic phase of insomnia. So we start to think, oh, my God. 
I'm not sleeping. I can't fall asleep. I've got so much to do tomorrow. I'm never going to get to sleep. It's yeah. going to like catastrophize and sort of, you know, magnify everything. And then yeah. look at the clock and keep looking at the clock. So the stop uh, technique can stop those thoughts. And again, it's about practice. The first few times, it may not be as powerful as perhaps you expect, but keep going with it, keep going. Yeah. But also, again, in terms of the challenging these thoughts with logic and with evidence, you know what? People wake up during the night and it's perfectly fine. That's a very good point, actually, because I don't think people realise that you do naturally wake up mm -hmm. a lot through the night. It's just, I guess that now people are so aware of Mm -hmm. not not sleeping the issues that they treat all those moments as as a real as a real problem um and i guess another thing i'm keen for people to do i don't know how you feel about this is when they can't sleep is to not just lie there in bed is to get up maybe this stop technique is something they can practice when the lights are nice down low in the comfort mm -hmm. of a warm room maybe they've got a nice warm drink to sort of give them comfort and help them to relax that kind of thing so i think it's brilliant yeah. Certainly. Oh, definitely. And, and also, I think just having the awareness that, you know, one solid sleep, it wasn't what we always did, actually, as, as you know, yeah. as humans, we used to have uh, at least a bimodal sleeping pattern where you'd go to sleep for a few, hour, few hours and you'd get up and then you protect your protect your, your tribe. And so you'd walk around mm -hmm. or you'd have something to drink or you go to the toilet and then you go back to sleep. And again, it wasn't this obsessing over having to have the seven to eight hours a night sleep those are good guidelines but actually they vary quite widely between people too they vary between ages so yeah. taking away that perfectionistic tendency around sleep can actually really manage insomnia and people can then pull themselves out of uh, sleeping patterns that are making them feel more tired in the day and the thing is I see quite a few clients that say well I really didn't sleep very well last night I said how did you feel when you wake up Oh, I felt fine. I said you didn't have daytime sleepiness. No, 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 it was fine. I said then it's then it's totally fine. It yeah. really is totally fine. And I think that is a really interesting point. It's like the eight-hour myth, isn't it? That yeah. you know, there's and actually I did a DNA test and it shows that you know it's in your genes that amount of time you need for optimal sleep. And I I had the lowest amount and I was really surprised. You know, yeah. it was around six six to seven hours. And I thought I do function quite well on that. And I think that the problem is people have got this eight hours stuck in their head because there is a lot of research about yeah. the health benefits long term. But they I had one client that was actually sleeping too much because I think they only needed about six or seven hours. And they were getting eight or nine and they said, I'm sleeping really well, but I'm waking up absolutely knackered and I'm really tired all through the day. And we work backwards and realize mm. she was getting too much sleep. Yeah. So I think it's really important to understand that. Hypersomnia is also a problem for sure. And I think that could be an issue for some people at the moment because we are at home more. And, you know, it can be nice to take a nap. And, and that's, there's nothing wrong with taking a nap per se. But if we are sleeping too much in the day, we need to almost take that time off the time at night yeah. because sleeping too much can make you feel very tired. It can make you feel very fatigued. It can make you uh, hungrier for foods that are going to also disturb your sleep, like high um, sugar, uh, high caffeine foods, things like that, because we're trying to not feel so tired. So it gets into a real vicious, vicious cycle yeah, without definitely. a doubt. But um, Rob, I want to ask you, actually, in, in terms of sleep, um, what are the environmental factors that you normally advice for people because people ask me what can I do I want to do something yeah. practical something practical well I definitely think you need to look at your uh it's all about bedroom hygiene and I mm -hmm. think the first thing you need to do is make your bedroom a real sleep oasis I think it's really important that everything's really clear you know mm -hmm. your room is nice and cool um you know our circadian rhythm is triggered the the hormone responses at night are triggered by temperature so it's important mm -hmm. to remain cool to get good sleep um hypoallergenic bedding is really important you and i are both really struggling at the moment mate, with <laughs> so and it keeps you awake right so having hypoallergenic bedding is good make sure your mattress is really good um you know keep the lights nice and low you don't want stark lighting that kind of thing just everything you can do that makes you want to go into that room and want to get into bed and fall asleep mm -hmm. um so i think that's really i think for me that's the most important thing in terms of your environment um Definitely. And I think when you talk about um, mattresses and, and, and bedding and things like that, I work with quite a few people that have, have different temperature needs. 
um yeah. you know it's you know this is a big generalization but women tend to feel cold a bit more so yeah. use separate duvets you know yes you can I'm use separate duvets and then you're not going to be pulling and tugging <laughs> on each other too. yeah i'm all for that because of uh, the problem i had with with the other half of bed but the other thing is you know menopause women during the menopause get very hot and so i think another thing to think about as well to happy to sleep at night is um, you know, the type of pajamas you wear, wear cotton pajamas, don't go to bed naked, because if you start sweating, and this is the same for the summer months, you need to take that sweat off your skin, rather than it sitting there between you and the bedding, and, and it's going to get quite, give you the chills, it's not gonna be very nice, so. Yeah, again, and that will wake you up. And that will wake you up, yeah. yeah. And, and definitely going back to the point um, of how to broach this subject with partners, yeah. um, I do think there's a bit of a, a taboo around sleep and you must sleep in the same bed and it must yeah. be um, magical and, and the best thing in the world to, to slumber with someone. But actually, it can be really, really difficult. Um, yeah. Then the impact that um, poor sleep can have on mood the next day can be significant. So you can be much more irritable. Yeah. You can really want to bite your partner's head off, especially if you feel like <laughs> <laughs> if you feel like they've been keeping you up. And I have yes. had quite a few clients say that they feel their partner's snoring has worsened uh, during lockdown. Yeah. Um, there's two things about that. I think so, some people uh, that perhaps is an issue at the moment. There is the hay fever yeah. thing that we both have that's going on. People are drinking a little bit more. Some people yeah. that affects it. And I didn't think weight gain. I think a lot of people have yeah. put a bit of weight on being locked in. And again, that's not yes. going to help snoring, is it? It's not. But one thing I would like to say as well um, is that if we are chronically stressed and if the anxiety is heightened, we probably are sleeping a little bit lighter. So it could be that your partner isn't snoring um, any, it could be that it's no worse at all, but you're just more aware of it. And again, I think understanding that sort of takes away that kind of blame scenario of you are keeping me awake, but broaching the subject is really important. Really important. Um, and it can feel tricky so I would say the biggest tip around that is to mind your language a bit and be very sensitive so rather than being accusatory and saying look you put on loads of weight and you're keeping me up because yeah. you're snoring your head off the language needs to be much more compassionate and saying I'm finding it very difficult um, because I'm not sleeping very well can we just look at things that could be affecting that and focusing yeah. a bit on the environment the room what can we do together to work as a partnership but then gently saying, and you know, maybe it is something to do with the booze. So let's both lay off the booze for a week and see yeah. how that works. Do some what psychologists call behavioral experiments and see the little tweaks that it could make. But definitely don't set yourself up for a confrontation, set yourself up for a collaboration. Okay. So shutting yourself in separate rooms and not talking to each other is not a great move then. <laughs> you know what? If it works for you, <laughs> totally fine. But no. <laughs> No, but it's, to be honest, like if, if someone's having really terrible hay fever and you want a couple of nights just in a separate room, there's, as I say, just such a taboo around that, but there's nothing wrong with that at all. I know many couples that sleep in separate rooms all the time and they have brilliant relationships. Yeah, if I had the option, I definitely would. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about, Meg, um, is mindfulness. I talk about it and I think a lot of people are really, um, they feel a bit overwhelmed by it all and they think that if they're not... A, true yogi or they understand how to breathe and meditate really well then it's something not for them and, and something they don't want to try but mm -hmm. you I always say you've got to find your mind mindfulness especially when it comes to sleep if you get up during the night if you've got that thing that you do it's a really good way to help to relax the mind reduce anxiety and help you to get back to sleep and this could be as simple as like coloring in couldn't mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. yeah there's some really good research about um, colouring and the effects on overall well-being, and it is a mindful practice. Um, I see so many clients that come to me that say they have tried everything, and they really have tried everything, and it becomes a little, a little bit of a maladaptive sort of behavioural pattern to try all these things because they want them to be perfect and they want to be perfect at them this actually causes a level of stress so because yeah. we have so much information coming in on us so instagram social media all these things yeah. and you're right it can be incredibly intimidating to see somebody um you know practicing yoga in such a way that you feel you'd never be able to attain and so then you just don't bother because yeah. it's it's too confronting 
But actually, mindfulness can be something as, as simple as coloring. I love rituals. So making a cup of tea, but doing it mindfully. So yep. really thinking about the sound of the water as it goes into the kettle, thinking about how the steam looks out when it's um, boiling, you know, thinking about how the water changes color, just being so observant and it stops the noise for a moment. And we just need to pepper our day with these moments. It makes such a difference, you know, to yeah. daily life. I but really like I also see quite a few people that mindfulness in some ways doesn't necessarily work. So we talk about mindlessness. So getting outside of your head and it can be whatever works for you. It could be playing music. It could be, um, you know, doing some artwork. It can be physical activity. So very active type mindfulness, but mindlessness because you're not constantly focusing on internal sensations you're fo focusing on the external and that for so many people works so much better yeah I really like that actually I think that would definitely work better for me and just when you're talking about the anxiety <clears throat> caused by thinking that you have to do something I just wanted to yeah. quickly mention this idea of sleep trackers I wrote a piece the other day and I've, I've read the research around how they can do you more harm than good as well you know this obsession with the numbers that you get on the sleep trackers thinking you need to get that perfect um, output of sleep can actually cause anxiety in itself and put you under stress. So I, it's not that I don't recommend them. I think they're really useful, but I think that if they are, if you're getting a bit obsessed with them, it could be getting in the way of, of your sleep. Uh, so it's worth something it's worth thinking about. Absolutely. And all these types of activity trackers, sleep trackers, um, all these technological uh, tools, they, they are tools and it's how we use them. That's the really important thing. And so if you feel yourself getting anxious when you look at the data in the morning, or if you look at your weekly data in terms of activity, take a break, yeah. take a break. Yeah. Okay. And obviously I'm going to mention supplements. Um, so in terms of relaxing and sleep, I know that I talk a lot to clients about magnesium, yeah, yeah, yeah. A really good one. Um, you know, it binds with GABA receptors in the brain. It helps to quieten down the anxiety, relax the body. Um, and that's so because there's, there's quite a lot of research, isn't there, that shows that magnesium is depleted during chronic stress. Yeah. yeah, which is a really interesting point. It could kind of get you in a vicious circle, really, couldn't mm -hmm. it? Because it's depleted yeah. during stress and the lower mass fit in the body can increase anxiety and sleep deficiency. Mm -hmm. So trying to snap out of that. So I, I, would you agree with me with magnesium on that one? Definitely. Um, and my sister and I, we actually use um, basalts that contain magnesium. And then so you're kind of, you know, doubling up, you're having a relaxing and mindful bath you can have. You can focus on the sensations um, of taking a bath. And then that is absorbed in a way that is just mixing up, isn't it? Yeah, it is definitely. And I know for, um, to help with sleep as well, you know, traditional mm -hmm. herbal remedies like valerian are mm -hmm. quite useful for some people. Um, it has the same effect of magnesium, I think, in the brain. It's that sort of GABA receptor effect. 5-HTP, um, and I, I know that um, some people get some relief from CBD um, in terms of their anxiety and stress. So I think there's a lot out there, isn't there, really? To try and help. You know what? Absolutely. What's so fascinating is all these things, they, they improve both sleep and mood. So you're getting the double whammy there. Yeah. And it just then shows how interlinked um, sleep and, and mental health really are. Brilliant. OK, so I guess the last question that I've got here is how we're going to adapt when we get back out. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm going to do. Um, how we, like, it's going to be quite weird, isn't it, to suddenly step out the door and get back into day to day life. It's been, well, how long has it been there? Seven weeks or something. So, mm -hmm. have you got any recommendations of how we get back to normal? Transitions can often feel challenging. So, we transitioned into this, um, and in a way, it was quite an abrupt transition. So I would say let's transition mindfully and, and gently and absolutely be compassionate with yourself um, and others around you. So as we find our way, treat yourself um, as kindly as you would a good friend. Uh, do not beat yourself up if you're finding anything difficult and talk to people uh, without a doubt. So still use the phone, use use video calls, um, maybe not all the time. There's some good research at the moment that video calls can actually 
be a little bit tiring, um, but be kind. Be kind to yourself. I love mm -hmm. that. Okay, so on that note, I think I'm going to leave it. Um, so thank you, Meg. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. And on behalf of the health and myself, um, I, we just want you still to take care and we'll yes. catch you next time. Thank you, Meg. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.